Section 14 of The Secret of the Night by Gaston LaRue. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Don W. Jenkins. Chapter 14 The Marshes. They ascertained the next day that there had been two explosions almost simultaneous, one under each staircase. The two nihilists, when they felt themselves discovered and watched by Ermolai, had thrown themselves silently on him as he turned his back in passing them, and strangled him with a piece of twine. Then they separated each to watch one of the staircases, reasoning that Kupriyan and General Trebasov would have to decide to descend. The Dasha des Iles was nothing now but a smoking ruin but from the fact that the living bombs had exploded separately the destructive effect was diffused and although there were numerous wounded as in the case of the attack on the stylopine dacha at least no one was killed outright that is excepting the two nihilists of whom no trace could be found save a few rags rouletabille had been hurled into the garden and he was glad enough to escape so a little shaken but without a scratch the group composed of Feodor and his friends were strangely protected by the lightness of the dacha's construction, the iron staircase, which, so to speak, almost hung to the two floors, being barely attached at top and bottom, raised under them, and then threw them off as it broke into a thousand pieces, but only after, by its very yielding, it had protected them from the first force of the bomb. They had risen from the ruins without mortal wounds kupriyan had a hand badly burned athanase georgevitch had his nose and cheeks seriously hurt ivan petrovitch lost an ear the most seriously injured was thaddeus tchitchnikov both of whose legs were broken extraordinarily enough the first person who appeared rising from the midst of the wreckage was matrena petrovna still holding feodor in her arms she had escaped with a few burns and the general saved again by the luck of the soldier whom death does not want was absolutely uninjured feodor gave shouts of joy they strove to quiet him because after all around him some poor wretches had been badly hurt as well as poor ermolai who lay there dead the domestics in the basement had been more seriously wounded and burned because the main force of the explosion had gone downwards which had probably saved the personages above rouletabille had been taken with the other victims to a neighboring dacha but as soon as he had shaken himself free of that terrible nightmare he escaped from the place he really regretted that he was not dead these successive waves of events had swamped him and he accused himself alone of all this disaster with acutest anxiety he had inquired about the condition of each of his victims Feodor had not been wounded, but now he was almost delirious, asking every other minute as the hours crept on for Natasha, who had not reappeared. That unhappy girl, Rouletabille, had steadily believed innocent. Was she a culprit? Ah, if she had only chosen to, if she had had confidence, he cried, raising anguished hands toward heaven, none of all this need have happened. No one would have attacked, and no one would ever again attack the life of Trebasov for I was not wrong in claiming before Kuprian that the general's life was in my hand, and I had the right to say to him, life for life, give me Matus, and I will give you the general's. And now there has been one more fruitless attempt to kill Feodor Feodorovitch, and it is Natasha's fault, that I swear, because she would not listen to me. And is Natasha implicated in it? Oh, my God! Rouletabille asked this vain question of the divinity, for he expected no more help in answering it on earth natasha innocent or guilty where was she what was she doing to know that to know if one were right or wrong and if one were wrong to disappear to die thus the unhappy rouletabille muttered as he walked along the bank of the neva not far from the ruins of the poor dacha where the joyous friends of feodor feodorovitch would have no more good dinners never so he soliloquized his head on fire and all at once he recovered trace of the young girl, that trace lost earlier, a trace left at her moment of flight, after the poisoning and before the explosion. And had he not in that a terrible coincidence? Because the poison might well have been only in preparation for the final attack, the pretext for the tragic arrival of the two false doctors, Natasha, Natasha, the living mystery surrounded already by so many dead, not far from the ruins of the dacha rouletabille soon made sure that a group of people had been there the night before 
coming from the woods nearby and returning to them he was able to be sure of this because the boundaries of the dacha had been guarded by troops and police as soon as the explosion took place under orders to keep back the crowd that hurried to eliaguin he looked attentively at the grass the ferns the broken and trampled twigs certainly a struggle had occurred there he could distinguish clearly in the soft earth of a narrow glade the prints of natasha's two little boots among all the large footprints he continued his search with his heart heavier and heavier he had a presentiment that he was on the point of discovering a new misfortune the footprints passed steadily under the branches along the side of the neva from a bush he picked a shred of white cloth and it seemed to him a veritable battle had taken place there torn branches strewed the grass he went on very close to the bank he saw by examination of the soil where there was no more trace of tiny heels and little shoes that the woman who had been found there was carried and carried into a boat of which the place of fastening to the bank was still visible they have carried off natasha he cried in a surge of anguish bungler that i am that is my fault too all my fault all my fault they wish to avenge michael nikolaevitch's death for which they hold natasha responsible and they have kidnapped her his eyes searched the great arm of the river for a boat the river was deserted not a sail nothing visible on the dead waters what shall i do what shall i do i must save her he resumed his course along the river who could give him any useful information he drew near a little shelter occupied by a guard the guard was speaking to an officer perhaps he had noticed something during his watch that evening along the river that branch of the river was almost always deserted after the day was over a boat plying between these shores in the twilight would certainly attract attention rouletabille showed the guard the paper Kupriyan had given him in the beginning and with the officer who turned out to be a police officer as interpreter he asked his questions as a matter of fact the guard had been sufficiently puzzled by the doings and comings of a light boat which after disappearing for an instant around the bend of the river had suddenly rowed swiftly out again and accosted a sailing yacht which appeared at the opening of the gulf it was one of those small but rapid and elegant sailing crafts such as are seen in the lachta regattas lachta the bay of lachta the word was a ray of light for the reporter who recalled now the counsel gunsovsky had given him watch the bay of lachka and tell me then if you still believe natasha is innocent gunsovsky must have known when he said this that natasha had embarked in company with the nihilists but evidently he was ignorant that she had gone with them under compulsion as their prisoner was it too late to save natasha in any case before he died he would try in every way possible so as at least to have kept her as much as he could from the disaster for which he held himself responsible he ran to the bark near the point his voice was firm as he hailed the canoe of the floating restaurant where thanks to him kuprian had been thwarted in impotent anger he had himself taken to just below staria derevnia and jumped out at the spot where he saw little katharina disappear a few days before he landed in the mud and climbed on hands and knees up the slope of a roadway which followed the bank this bank led to the bay of lachka not far from the frontier of finland on rouletabille's left lay the sea the immense gulf with slight waves to his right was the decaying stretch of marsh stagnant water stretching to the horizon coarse grass and reeds an extraordinary tangle of water plants small ponds whose greenish scum did not stir under the stiff breeze water that was heavy and dirty along this narrow strip of land thrust thus between the marsh the sky and the sea he hurried with many stumblings his eyes fixed on the deserted gulf suddenly he turned his head at a singular noise at first he didn't see anything but heard in the distance a vague clamoring while a sort of vapor commenced to rise from the marsh then he noticed nearer him the high marsh grasses undulating finally he saw a countless flock rising from the bed of the marshes beasts groups of beasts whose horns one saw like bayonets jostled each other trying to keep to the firm land many of them swam and on the backs of some were naked men stark naked with hair falling to their shoulders and streaming behind them like manes they shouted war cries and waved their clubs rouletabille stopped short before this prehistoric invasion he would never have imagined that a few miles from the newski prospect he could have found himself in the midst of such a spectacle these savages had not even a loincloth where did they come from with their herd 
from what remote place in the world or in old and gone history had they emerged and what was this new invasion what prodigious slaughterhouse awaited these unruly herds they made a noise like thunder in the marsh here were a thousand unkempt haunches undulating in the marsh like the ocean as a storm approaches the stark naked men jumped along the route waving their clubs crying gutturally in a way the beasts seemed to understand they worked their way out from the marsh and turned toward the city leaving behind to swath the view of them a while and then fade away a pestilential haze that hung like an aura about the naked long-haired men it was terrible and magnificent in order not to be shoved into the water rouletabille had climbed a small rock that stood beside the route and had waited there as though petrified himself when the barbarians had finally passed by he climbed down again but the route had become a bog of trampled filth happily he heard the noise of a primitive conveyance behind him it was a telega curiously primitive the telega is four-wheeled with two planks thrown crudely across the axle-trees rouletabille gave the man who was seated in it three roubles and jumped into the planks beside him and the two little finnish horses whose manes hung clear to the mud went like the wind such crude conveyances are necessary on such crude roads but it requires a strong constitution to make a journey on them still the reporter felt none of the jolting he was so intent on the sea and the coast of lachka bay the vehicle finally reached a wooden bridge across a murky creek as the day commenced to fade colorlessly rouletabille jumped off onto the shore and his rustic equipage crossed to the sestroyesk side it was a corner of land black and sombre as his thoughts that he surveyed now watch the bay of lachka the reporter knew that this desolate plain this impenetrable marsh this sea which offered the fugitive refuge in innumerable fords had always been a useful retreat for nihilistic adventurers a hundred legends circulated in st petersburg about the mysteries of lachka marshes and that gave him his last hope maybe he would be able to run across some revolutionaries to whom he could explain about natasha as prudently as possible he might even see natasha herself gounsovsky could not have spoken vain words to him between the Latskrinsky marsh and the strand he perceived on the edge of the forest which run as far as sestroyesk a little wooden house whose walls were painted a reddish brown and its roof green it was not the russian isba but the finnish tuba however a russian sign announced it to be a restaurant the young man had to take only a few steps to enter it he was the only customer there an old man with glasses and a long grey beard evidently the proprietor of the establishment stood behind the counter presiding over the zakuskis rouletabille chose some little sandwiches which he placed on a plate he took a bottle of pivo and made the man understand that later if it were possible he would like a good hot supper the other made a sign that he understood and showed him into an adjoining room which was used for diners rouletabille was quite ready enough to die in the face of his failures but he did not wish to perish from hunger a table was placed beside a window looking out over the sea and over the entrance to the bay it could not have been better with his eye now on the horizon now on the estuary near by he commenced to eat with gloomy avidity he was inclined to feel sorry for himself to indulge in self-pity just the same two and two always makes four he said to himself but in my calculations perhaps i have forgotten the surd ah there was a time when i would not have overlooked anything and even now i haven't overlooked anything if natasha is innocent having literally scoured the plate he struck the table a great blow with his fist and said she is just then the door opened rouletabille supposed the proprietor of the place was entering it was Couperin. he rose startled he could not imagine by what mystery the prefect of police had made his way here but he rejoiced from the bottom of his heart for if he was trying to rescue natasha from the hands of the revolutionaries Couperin would be a valuable ally he clapped the prefect on the shoulder well well he said almost joyfully i certainly did not expect you here how is your wound Nichevo, not worth speaking about it's nothing and the general and ah that frightful night and those two unfortunates who Nichevo, Nichevo, and poor ermolai Nichevo, Nichevo, it is nothing rouletabille looked him over the prefect of police had an arm in a sling but he was bright and shining as a new ten-rouble piece while he poor rouletabille was so abominably soiled and depressed where did he come from Couperin understood his look and smiled well i have just come from the finland train it is the best way well what can you have come here to do excellency the same thing as you 
bah exclaimed rouletabille do you mean to say that you have come here to save natasha how to save her i came to capture her to capture her monsieur rouletabille i have a very fine little dungeon in saints peter and paul fortress that is all ready for her you are going to throw natasha into a dungeon the emperor's order monsieur rouletabille and if you see me here in person it's simply because his majesty requires that the thing be done as respectfully and discreetly as possible natasha in prison cried the reporter who saw horror in all aspects rising before him at one and the same time for what reasons pray the reason is simple enough natasha fedorovna is the last word in wickedness and doesn't deserve anybody's pity she is the accomplice of the revolutionaries and the instigator of all the crimes against her father i am sure you are mistaken excellency but how have you been guided to her simply by you by me yes we lost all trace of natasha but as you had disappeared also i made up my mind that you could only be occupied in searching for her and that by finding you i might have the chance to lay my hands on her but i haven't seen any of your men why one of them brought you here me yes you didn't you climb onto a telega ah the driver exactly i had arranged to have him meet me at the sestroyesk station he pointed out the place where you dropped off and here i am the reporter bent his head red with chagrin decidedly the sinister idea that he was responsible for the death of an innocent man and all the ills which had followed out of it had paralyzed his detective talents he recognized it now what was the use of struggling if anyone had told him that he would be played with that way some time he rouletabille he would have laughed heartily enough then but now well he wasn't capable of anything further he was his own most cruel enemy not only was natasha in the hands of the revolutionaries through his fault by his abominable error but worse yet in the very moment when he wished to save her he foolishly naively had conducted the police to the very spot where they should have been kept away it was the depth of his humiliation Couperion really pitied the reporter come don't blame yourself too much said he we would have found natasha without you gonsovsky notified us that she was going to embark in the bay of lachka this evening with priemkov natasha with priemkov exclaimed rouletabille natasha with the man who introduced the two living bombs into her father's house if she is with him excellency it is because she is his prisoner and that alone will be sufficient to prove her innocence i thank the heaven that has sent you here Kuprian swallowed a glass of vodka poured another after it and finally deigned to translate his thought natasha is the friend of these precious men and we will see them disembark hand in hand your men then haven't studied the traces of the struggle that these precious men have had on the banks of the neva before they carried away natasha oh they haven't been hoodwinked as a matter of fact the struggle was quite too visible not to have been done for appearances sake what a child you are can't you see that natasha's presence in the dacha had become quite too dangerous for that charming young girl after the poisoning of her father and stepmother failed and at that moment when her comrades were preparing to send general trebasov a pleasant little gift of dynamite she arranged to get away and yet to appear kidnapped it is too simple rouletabille raised his head there is something simpler still to imagine than the culpability of natasha it is that priemkov schemed to pour the poison into the flask of vodka saying to himself that if the poison didn't succeed at least it would make the occasion for introducing his dynamite into the house in the pockets of the doctors that they would go to find kuprian seized rouletabille's wrist and threw some terrible words at him looking into the depths of his eyes it was not priemkov who poured the poison because there was no poison in the flask rouletabille as he heard this extraordinary declaration rose more startled than he had ever been in the course of this startling campaign if there was no poison in the flask the poison must have been poured directly into the glasses by a person who was in the kiosk now there were only four persons in the kiosk the two who were poisoned and natasha and himself rouletabille and that kiosk was so perfectly isolated that it was impossible for any other persons than the four who were there to pour poison upon the table but it is not possible he cried it is so possible that it is so Perry alexis declared that there is no poison in the flask and i ought to tell you that an analysis i had made after his bears him out there was no poison either in the small bottle you took to Perry alexis and into which you yourself had poured the contents of natasha's glass and yours 
no trace of poison excepting in two of the four glasses arsenate of soda was found only on the soiled napkins of trebasoff and his wife and in the two glasses they drank from oh that is horrible muttered the stupefied reporter that is horrible for then the poisoner must be either natasha or me i have every confidence in you declared kuprian with a great laugh of satisfaction striking him on the shoulder and i arrest natasha and you who love logic ought to be satisfied now rouletabille hadn't a word more to say he sat down again and let his head fall into his hands like one sleep has seized ah our young girls you don't know them they are terrible terrible said kuprian lighting a big cigar much more terrible than the boys in good families the boys still enjoy themselves but the girls they read it goes to their heads they are ready for anything they know neither father nor mother ah you are a child you cannot comprehend two lovely eyes a melancholy air a soft low voice and you are captured you believe you have before you simply an inoffensive good little girl well rouletabille here is what i will tell you for your instruction there was the time of the chipov attack the revolutionaries who were assigned to kill chipov were disguised as coachmen and footmen everything had been carefully prepared and it would seem that no one could have discovered the bombs in the place they had been stored well do you know the place where those bombs were found in the rooms of the governor of vladimir's daughter exactly my little friend just there the rooms of the governor's daughter mademoiselle alexiev ah these young girls besides it was this same mademoiselle alexiev who so prettily pierced the brain of an honest swiss merchant who had the misfortune to resemble one of our ministers if we had hanged that charming young girl earlier my dear monsieur rouletabille that last catastrophe might have been avoided a good rope around the neck of all these little females it is the only way the only way a man entered rouletabille recognized the driver of the telega there were some rapid words between the chief and the agent the man closed the shutters of the room but through the interstices they would be able to see what went on outside then the agent left kuprian as he pushed aside the table that was near the window said to the reporter you had better come to the window my man has just told me the boat is drawing near you can watch an interesting sight we are sure that natasha is still aboard the yacht after the explosion at the dacha took up two men who put off to it in a canoe and since then it has simply sailed back and forth in the gulf we have taken our precautions in finland the same as here and it is here they are going to try to disembark keep an eye on them kuprian was at his post of observation evening slowly fell the sky was growing grayish black a tint that blended with the slate-colored sea to those on the bank the sound of the man about to die came softly across the water there was a sail far out between the strand and the tuba where kuprian watched was a ridge a window which however did not hide the shore or the bay from the prefect of police because at the height where he was his glance passed at an angle above it but from the sea this ridge entirely hid any one who lay in ambush behind it the reporter watched fifty moujiks flat on their stomachs crawling up the ridge behind two of their number whose heads alone topped the ridge in the line of gaze taken by those two heads was the white sail looming much larger now the yacht was heeled in the water and glided with real elegance heading straight on suddenly just when they supposed she was coming straight to shore the sails fell and a canoe was dropped over the side four men got into it then a woman jumped lightly down a little gangway into the canoe it was natasha kuprian had no difficulty in recognizing her through the gathering darkness ah my dear monsieur rouletabille said he see your prisoner of the nihilists notice how she is bound her thongs certainly are causing her great pain these revolutionaries surely are brutes the truth was that natasha had gone quite readily to the rudder and while the others rowed she steered the light boat to the place on the beach that had been pointed out to her soon the prow of the canoe touched the sands there did not seem to be a soul about and that was the conclusion the men in the canoe who stood up looking round seemed to reach they jumped out and then it was natasha's turn she accepted the hand held out to her talking pleasantly with the men all the time she even turned to press the hand of one of them the group came up across the beach all this time the watchers in the little eating-house could see the false moujiks who had wriggled on their stomachs to the very edge of the ridge holding themselves ready to spring behind his shutter kuprian could not restrain an exclamation of triumph he gradually identified some of the figures in the group and muttered eh eh there is priemkoff himself and the others 
Gunsovsky is right, and he certainly is well informed. His system is decidedly a good one. What a netful! He hardly breathed as he watched the outcome. He could discern elsewhere beside the bay, flat on the ground, concealed by the slightest elevation of the soil, other false mujiks. The wood of Sestroyesk was watched in the same way. The group of revolutionaries who strolled behind Natasha stopped to confer. In three, maybe two, minutes they would be surrounded, cut off, taken in the trap. Suddenly a gunshot sounded in the night, and the group, with startled speed, turned in their tracks and made silently for the sea, while from all directions poured the concealed agents and threw themselves into the pursuit, jostling each other and crying after the fugitives. But the cries became cries of rage, for the group of revolutionaries gained the beach. They saw Natasha, who was held up by Priemkov himself, reject the aid of the nihilist, who did not wish to abandon her in order that he might save himself. She made him go, and seeing that she was going to be taken, stopped short and waited for the enemy stoically, with folded arms. Meanwhile, her three companions succeeded in throwing themselves into the canoe and plied the oars hard, while Kuprian's men, in the water up to their chests, discharged their revolvers at the fugitives. The men in the canoe, fearing to wound Natasha, made no reply to the firing. The yacht had sails up by the time they drew alongside and made off like a bird toward the mysterious fords of Finland, audaciously hoisting the black flag of the revolution. Meanwhile, Kuprian's agents, trembling before his anger, gathered at the eating-house. The prefect of police let his fury loose on them and treated them like the most infamous of animals. The capture of Natasha was little comfort. He had planned for the whole bag, and his men's stupidity took away all his self-control. If he had had a whip at hand, he would have found prompt solace for his mind hopes. Natasha, standing in a corner with her face singularly calm, watched this extraordinary scene that was like a menagerie in which the tamer himself had become a wild beast. From another corner Rouletabille kept his eyes fixed on Natasha, who ignored him. Ah, that girl, sphinx to them all, even to him who thought a while ago that he could read things invisible to other vulgar men in her features, in her eyes the impassive face of that girl whose father they had tried to assassinate only a few hours before and who had just pressed the hand of priemkov the assassin once she turned her head slightly toward rouletabille the reporter then looked toward her with increased eagerness his eyes burning as though he would say surely natasha you are not the accomplice of your father's assassins surely it was not you who poured the poison but natasha's glance passed the reporter coldly over ah that mysterious cold mask the mouth with its bitter impudent smile an atrocious smile which seemed to say to the reporter if it is not i who poured the poison then it is you it was the visage common enough to the daughters whom Kuprian had spoken of a little while before the young girls who read and their reading done set themselves to accomplish some terrible thing some thing because of which from time to time they place stiff ropes around the necks of these young females finally Kuprian's frenzy wore itself out, and he made a sign. The men filed out in dismal silence. Two of them remained to guard Natasha. From outside came the sounds of a carriage from Sestroyesk, ready to convey the girl to the dungeons of Saints Peter and Paul. A final gesture from the prefect of police and the rough hands of the two guards seized the prisoner's frail wrists. They hustled her along, thrust her outside, jamming her against the doorway, venting thus their anger at the reproaches of their chief. A few seconds later the carriage departed, not to stop until the fortress was reached with the trickling tombs under the bed of the river where young girls about to die are confined, who have read too much, without entirely understanding, as Monsieur Kropotkin says. Kuprian prepared to leave in turn. Rouletabille stopped him. Excellency, I wish you to tell me why you have shown such anger to your men just now. They're brute beasts, cried the chief of police, quite beside himself again. They have made me miss the biggest catch of my life. They threw themselves on the group two minutes too early. Some of them fired a gun that they took for the signal, and that served to warn the nihilists. But I will let them all rot in prison until I learn which one fired that shot. You needn't look far for that, said Rouletabille. I did it. You? Then you must have gone outside the tuba. Yes, in order to warn them. But still I was a little late, since you did take Natasha. Kuprian's eyes blazed. "'You are their accomplice in all this,' he hurled at the reporter, "'and I am going to the Tsar for permission to arrest you.' "'Hurry then, Excellency,' replied the reporter coldly, "'because the nihilists, who also think they have a little account to settle with me, may reach me before you.' And he saluted. End of chapter 14
read by don w jenkins rancho san diego california shaggybark.blogspot.com Section 15 of The Secret of the Night by Gaston LaRue. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Don W. Jenkins. Chapter 15. I Have Been Waiting for You. At the hotel, a note from Gunsovsky. Don't forget this time to come tomorrow to have luncheon with me. Warmest regards from Madame Gunsovsky then a horrible sleepless night shaken with echoes of explosions and the clamour of the wounded and the solemn shade of peri alexis stretching out toward rouletabille a file of poison and saying either natasha or you then rising among the shades the bloody form of michael nikolaevitch the innocent in the morning a note from the marshal of the court monsieur le marechal had no particular good news evidently for in terms quite without enthusiasm he invited the young man to luncheon for that same day rather early at midday as he wished to see him once more before he left for france i see said rouletabille to himself monsieur le marechal pronounces my expulsion from the country and he forgot once more the gunsovsky luncheon the meeting-place named was the great restaurant called the bear Rouletabille entered it promptly at noon. He asked the Svitsar if the Grand Marshal of the Court had arrived, and was told no one had seen him yet. They conducted him to the huge main hall, where, however, there was only one person. This man, standing before the table spread with zakuskis, was stuffing himself. At the sound of Rouletabille's step on the floor, this soul-famished patron turned and lifted his hands to heaven as he recognized the reporter the latter would have given all the roubles in his pocket to have avoided the recognition but he was already face to face with the advocate so celebrated for his table feats the amiable athanase georgevitch his head swathed in bandages and dressings from the midst of which one could perceive distinctly only the eyes and above all the mouth how goes it little friend how are you oh i there is nothing the matter in a week we shall have forgotten it what a terrible affair said the reporter i certainly believed we were all dead men no no it was nothing nichevo and poor thaddeus chichnikoff with his two poor legs broken eh nichevo he has plenty of good solid splints that will make him two good legs again nichevo don't you think any more about that it is nothing and you have come here to dine a very celebrated house this caracho he busied himself to do the honors one would have said the restaurant belonged to him he boasted of its architecture and the cuisine a la francaise do you know he inquired confidently a finer restaurant room anywhere in the world in fact it seemed to rouletabille as he looked up into the high glass arch that he was in a railway station decorated for some illustrious traveller for there were flowers and plants everywhere but the visitor whom the ball awaited was the russian eater the ogre who never failed to come to eat at the bear pointing out the lines of tables shining with their white cloths and bright silver athanase georgevitch with his mouth full said ah my dear little french monsieur you should see it at supper-time with the women and the jewels and the music there is nothing in france that can give you any idea of it nothing the gaiety the champagne and the jewels monsieur worth millions and millions of roubles our women wear them all everything they have they are decked like sacred shrines all the family jewels from the very bottom of the caskets it is magnificent thoroughly russian muscovite what am i saying it is asiatic monsieur in the evening at a fete we are asiatic let me tell you something on the quiet you notice that this enormous dining hall is surrounded by those windowed balconies each of those windows belongs to a separate private room well you see that window there yes there that is the room of the grand duke yes he's the one i mean a very gay grand duke do you know one evening when there was a crowd here families monsieur party families high-born families the window of that particular balcony was thrown open and a woman stark naked as naked as my hand monsieur was dropped into the dining hall and ran across it full speed it was a wager monsieur a wager of the jolly grand dukes and the demoiselle won it but what a scandal ah don't speak of it that would be very bad form but sufficiently asiatic eh truly asiatic and something much more unfortunate you see that table 
it happened the russian new year eve at supper all the beauty the whole capital was here just at midnight the orchestra struck up the boja tsara krani footnote the russian national anthem end of footnote to inaugurate the joyful russian new year and everybody stood up according to custom and listened in silence as loyal subjects should well at that table accompanying his family there was a young student a fine fellow very correct and in uniform this unhappy young student who had risen like everybody else to listen to the boja tsara krani inadvertently placed his knee on a chair truly that is not a correct attitude monsieur but it really was no reason for killing him was it certainly not well a brute in uniform an officer quite immaculately gotten up drew a revolver from his pocket and discharged it at the student point blank you can imagine the scandal for the student was dead there were paris journalists there besides who had never been there before you see monsieur gaston leroux was at that very table what a scandal they had a regular battle they broke carafes over the head of the assassin for he was neither more or less than an assassin a drinker of blood an asiatic they picked up the assassin who was bleeding all over and carried him off to look after him as to the dead man he lay stretched out there under a tablecloth waiting for the police and those at the tables went on with their drinking isn't that asiatic enough for you here a naked woman there a corpse and the jewels and the champagne what do you say to that his excellency the grand marshal of the court is waiting for you monsieur rouletabille shook hands with athanase georgevitch who returned to his zakouskis and followed the interpreter to the door of one of the private rooms the high dignitary was there with a charm in his politeness of which the high-born russian possesses the secret over almost everybody else in the world the marshal intimated to rouletabille that he had incurred imperial displeasure you have been denounced by Kuprian, who holds you responsible for the checks he has suffered in this affair monsieur Kuprian is right replied rouletabille and his majesty should believe him since it is the truth but don't fear anything from me monsieur le grand marechal for i shall not inconvenience monsieur Kuprian any further nor anybody else i shall disappear i believe Kuprian is already directed to visa your passport he is very good and he does himself much harm all that is a little your fault monsieur rouletabille we believed we could consider you as a friend and you have never failed it appears on each occasion to give your help to our enemies who says that Coprian. oh it is necessary to be one with us and you are not one with us and if you are not for us you are against us you understand that i think that is the way it has to be the terrorists have returned to the methods of the nihilists who succeeded altogether too well against alexander the second when i tell you that they succeeded in placing their messages even in the imperial palace yes yes said rouletabille vaguely as though he were already far removed from the contingencies of this world i know that tsar alexander the second sometimes found under his napkin a letter announcing his condemnation to death monsieur at the chateau yesterday morning something happened that is perhaps more alarming than the letter found by alexander the second under his napkin what can it be have bombs been discovered no it is a bizarre occurrence and almost unbelievable the eiderdowns all the eiderdown coverings belonging to the imperial family disappeared yesterday morning footnote historically authentic end of footnote surely not it is just as i say and it was impossible to learn what had become of them until yesterday evening when they were found again in their proper places in the chambers that is the new mystery certainly but how were they taken out shall we ever know all we found was two feathers this morning in the boudoir of the empress which leads us to think that the eiderdowns were taken out that way i am taking the two feathers to Kuprian let me see them asked the reporter rouletabille looked them over and handed them back and what do you think the whole affair means we are inclined to regard it as a threat by the revolutionaries if they can carry away the eiderdowns it would be quite as easy for them to carry away the imperial family no i don't think it is that what do you mean then i nothing any more not only do i not think any more but i don't wish to tell me monsieur le grand marechal it is useless i suppose to try to see his majesty before i go what good would that do monsieur we know everything now this natasha that you defended against Kuprian has proved the culprit the last affair does not leave that in any reasonable doubt and she is taken care of from this time on his majesty wishes never to hear natasha spoken of again under any pretext 
"'What are you going to do with that young girl?' "'The Tsar has decided that there shall not be any trial, and that the daughter of Trebasov shall be sent by administrative order to Siberia. The Tsar, monsieur, is very good, for he might have had her hanged. She deserved it.' "'Yes, yes, the Tsar is very good.' "'You are very absorbed, Monsieur Rouletabille, and you are not eating.' "'I have no appetite, Monsieur le Maréchal. Tell me, the Emperor must be rather bored at Tsartskoicello.' "'Oh, he has plenty of work. He rises at seven o'clock and has a light English luncheon, tea and toast. At eight o'clock he starts and works till ten. From ten to eleven he promenades.' "'In the jail-yard?' asked Rouletabille, innocently. "'What's that you say? Ah, you are an enfant terrible.' certainly we do well to send you away until eleven he promenades in a pathway of the park from eleven to one he holds audience luncheon at one then he spends the time till half past two with his family what does he eat soup his majesty is wonderfully fond of soup he takes it at every meal after luncheon he smokes but never a cigar always cigarettes gifts of the sultan and he only drinks one liqueur maraschino at half-past two he goes out again for a little air always in his park then he sets himself to work until eight o'clock it is simply frightful work with heaps of useless papers and numberless signatures no secretary can spare him that ungrateful bureaucratic duty he must sign 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 and read 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 the reports it is work without any beginning or end as soon as some reports go others arrive at eight o'clock dinner then more signatures working right up to eleven o'clock at eleven o'clock he goes to bed and he sleeps to the rhythmical tramp of the guards on patrol added rouletabille bluntly oh young man young man pardon me monsieur le grand marechal said the reporter rising i am indeed a disturbing spirit and i know that i have nothing more to do in this country you will not see me any more monsieur le grand marechal but before leaving i ought to tell you how much i have been touched by the hospitality of your great nation that hospitality is sometimes a little dangerous but it is always magnificent no other nation in the world knows like the russians how to receive a man your excellency i speak as i feel and that isn't affected by my manner of quitting you for you know also how to put a man to the door adieu then without any rancour my most respectful homage to his majesty ah just one word more you will recall that natasha fedorovna was engaged to poor boris murazov still another man who has disappeared and who before disappearing charged me to deliver to general trebasov's daughter this last token these two little icons i entrust you with this mission monsieur le grand marechal your servant excellency rouletabille redescended the great canouche now said he to himself it is my turn to buy farewell presents and he made his way slowly across the place des grand Ecuries and the bridge of the catherine canal he entered aptikarsky paraluk and pushed open para alexis's door under the arch at the back of the obscure court health and prosperity alexis hutch ah you again little man well kuprian has let you know the result of my analyses yes yes tell me alexis hutch you are sure you are not mistaken you don't think you might be mistaken think carefully before you answer it is a question of life or death for whom for me for you good little friend you want to make your old perry lexis laugh or weep answer me no i couldn't be mistaken the thing is as certain as that we two are here arsenate of soda in the stains on the two napkins and the traces of arsenate of soda in two of the four glasses none in the carafe none in the little bottle none in the two glasses i say it before you and before god so it is really true thank you alexis hutch kuprian has not tried to deceive me there has been nothing of that sort well do you know alexis hutch who has poured the poison it is she or i and as it is not i it is she and since it is she well i am going to die you love her then inquired Perry alexis no replied rouletabille with a self-mocking smile no i don't love her but if it is she who poured the poison then it was not michael nikolaevitch and it is i who had michael nikolaevitch killed you can see how therefore i must die show me your finest images ah my little one if you will permit your old alexis to make you a gift i would offer these two poor icons that are certainly from the convent of troitsa at its best period see how beautiful they are and old have you ever seen so beautiful a mother of god and this saint luke would you believe that the hand has been mended eh two little masterpieces little friend if the old masters of salonica returned to the world they would be satisfied with their pupils at troitsa but you mustn't kill yourself at your age 
Come, Bat Uxka, little father, I accept your gift, and if I meet the old Salonican masters on the road I am going to travel, I shan't fail to tell them there is no person here below who appreciates them like a certain pair of Aptikarsky Paraluk, Alexis Hutch. So saying, Rouletabille wrapped up the little icons and put them in his pocket. The Saint Luke would be sure to appeal to his friend Saint Clair. As to the Mother of God, that would be his dying gift to the Dame in War. Ah, you are sad, little son, and your voice, as it sounds now, hurts me. Rouletabille turned his head at the sound of two moujiks who entered, carrying a long basket. What do you want? demanded Perry Alexis in Russian. And what is that you are bringing in? Do you intend to fill the huge basket with my goods? In that case you are very welcome, and I am your humble servant. But the two chuckled. Yes, yes, we have come to rid your shop of a wretched piece of goods that litters it. What is this, you say? inquired the old man anxiously, and drawing near Rouletabille. Little friend, watch these men. I don't recognize their faces, and I can't understand why they have come here. Rouletabille looked at the newcomers, who drew near the counter, after depositing their long basket close to the door. There was a sarcastic and malicious mocking way about them that struck him from the first. But while they kept up their jabbering with Perry Alexis, he filled his pipe and proceeded to light it. Just then the door was pushed open again, and three men entered, simply dressed, like respectable small merchants. They also acted curiously and looked all around the shop. Perry Alexis grew more and more alarmed, and the others pulled rudely at his beard. "'I believe these men here have come to rob me,' he cried in French. "'What do you say, my son? Shall I call the police?' "'Hold on,' replied Rouletabille impassively. "'They are all armed. They have revolvers in their pockets.' Perry Alexis's teeth commenced to chatter. As he tried to get near the door, he was roughly pushed back, and a final personage entered, apparently a gentleman, and dressed as such, save that he wore a visored leather cap. Ah, said he at once in French, why it is the young French journalist of the Grand Morskaya Hotel. Salutations and your good health. I see with pleasure that you also appreciate the counsels of our dear Perry Alexis. Don't listen to him, little friend. I don't know him, cried Alexis Hutch, but the gentleman of the Neva went on. He is a man close to the first principles of science, and therefore not far from divine. He is a holy man whom it is good to consult at moments when the future appears difficult. He knows how to read as no one else can, Father John of Kronstadt accepted, to be strictly accurate, on the sheets of bullhide where the dark angels have traced mysterious signs of destiny. Here the gentleman picked up an old pair of boots, which he threw on the counter in the midst of the icons. Perry Alexis, perhaps these are not bullhide, but good enough cowhide. Don't you want to read on this cowhide the future of this young man? But here Rouletabille advanced to the gentleman and blew an enormous cloud of smoke full in his face. "'It is useless, monsieur,' said Rouletabille, "'to waste your time and your breath. I have been waiting for you.'" End of chapter 15 Read by Don W. Jenkins Rancho San Diego, California Shaggybark.blogspot.com Section 16 of The Secret of the Night by Gaston LaRue. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Don W. Jenkins. Chapter 16. Before the Revolutionary Tribunal. Only Rouletabille refused to be put into the basket. He would not let them disarm him until they promised to call a carriage. The vehicle rolled into the court, and while Perry Alexis was kept back in his shop, at the point of a revolver, Rouletabille quietly got in, smoking his pipe. The man who appeared to be the chief of the band, the gentleman of the Neva, got in too and sat down beside him. The carriage windows were shuttered, preventing all communication with the outside, and only a tiny lantern lighted the interior. They started. The carriage was driven by two men in brown coats trimmed with false astrakhan. The Dvornik saluted, believing it a police affair. The concierge made the sign of the cross. The journey lasted several hours without other incidents than those brought about by the tremendous jolts which threw the two passengers inside one on top of the other. This might have made an opening for conversation, and the gentlemen of the Neva tried it, but in vain. Rouletabille would not respond. At one moment, indeed, the gentleman who was growing bored became so pressing that the reporter finally said, in the curt tone he always used when he was irritated, 
i pray monsieur let me smoke my pipe in peace upon which the gentleman prudently occupied himself in lowering one of the windows for it grew stifling finally after much jolting there was a stop while the horses were changed and the gentleman asked rouletabille to let himself be blindfolded the moment has come they are going to hang me without any form of trial thought the reporter and when blindfolded with the bandage he felt himself lifted under the arms there was revolt of his whole being that being which now that it was on the point of dying did not wish to cease rouletabille would have believed himself stronger more courageous more stoical at least but blind instinct swept all of this away that instinct of conservation which had no concern with the minor bravados of the reporter no concern with the fine heroic manner of the determined pose to die finely because the instinct of conservation which is as its rigid name indicates essentially materialistic demands only thinks of nothing but to live and it was that instinct which made rouletabille's last pipe die out unpuffed the young man was furious with himself and he grew pale with the fear that he might not succeed in mastering this emotion he took fierce hold of himself and his members which had stiffened at the contact of seizure by rough hands relaxed and he allowed himself to be led truly he was disgusted with his faintness and weakness he had seen men die who knew they were going to die his task as reporter had led him more than once to the foot of the guillotine and the wretches he had seen there had died bravely extraordinarily enough the most criminal had ordinarily met death most bravely of course they had had leisure to prepare themselves thinking a long time in advance of that supreme moment but they affronted death came to it almost negligently found strength even to say banal or taunting things to those around them he recalled above all a boy of eighteen years old who had cowardly murdered an old woman and two children in a back-country farm and had walked to his death without a tremor talking reassuringly to the priest and the police official who walked almost sick with horror on either side of him could he then not be as brave as that child they made him mount some steps and he felt that he had entered the stuffy atmosphere of a closed room then someone removed the bandage he was in a room of sinister aspect and in the midst of a rather large company within these naked neglected walls there were about thirty young men some of them apparently quite as young as rouletabille with candid blue eyes and pale complexions the others older men were of the physical type of christs not the animated christs of occidental painters but those that are seen on the panels of the byzantine school or fastened on the icons sculptures of silver or gold their long hair deeply parted in the middle fell upon their shoulders in curl-tipped golden masses some leaned against the wall erect and motionless others were seated on the floor their legs crossed most of them were in winter coats bought in the bazaars but there were also men from the country with their skins of beasts their seans their touloupes one of them had his legs laced about with cords and was shod with twined willow twigs the contrast afforded by various ones of these grave and attentive figures showed that representatives from the entire revolutionary party were present at the back of the room behind a table three young men were seated and the oldest of them was not more than twenty-five and had the benign beauty of christ on feast days canopied by consecrated palms in the centre of the room a small table stood quite bare and without any apparent purpose on the right was another table with paper pens and inkstands it was there that rouletabille was conducted and asked to be seated then he saw that another man was at his side who was required to keep standing his face was pale and desperate very drawn his eyes burned somberly in spite of the panic that deformed his features rouletabille recognized one of the unintroduced friends whom gounsovski had brought with him to the supper at krestowski evidently since then the always threatening misfortune had fallen upon him they were proceeding with his trial the one who seemed to preside over these strange sessions pronounced a name anuchka a door opened and anuchka appeared rouletabille hardly recognized her she was so strangely dressed like the russian poor with her under jacket of red flannel and the handkerchief which knotted under her chin covered all her beautiful hair she immediately testified in russian against the man who protested until they compelled him to be silent she drew from her pocket papers which were read aloud and which appeared to crush the accused he fell back onto his seat he shivered 
he hid his head in his hands and rouletabille saw the hands tremble the man kept that position while the other witnesses were heard their testimony arousing murmurs of indignation that were quickly checked Anuchka had gone to take her place with the others against the wall in the shadows which more and more invaded the room at this ending of a lugubrious day two windows reaching to the floor let a wan light creep with difficulty through their dirty panes making a vague twilight in the room soon nothing could be seen of the motionless figures against the wall much as the faces fade in the frescoes from which the centuries have effaced the colors and the depths of orthodox convents now someone from the depths of the shadow and the appalling silence read something the verdict doubtless the voice ceased then some of the figures detached themselves from the wall and advanced the man who crouched near rouletabille rose in a savage bound and cried out rapidly wild words supplicating words menacing words and then nothing more but strangling gasps the figures that had moved out from the wall had clutched his throat the reporter said it is cowardly Anuchka's voice low from the depths of the shadow replied it is just but rouletabille was satisfied with having said that for he had proved to himself that he could still speak his emotion had been such since they had pushed him into the centre of this sinister and expeditious revolutionary assembly of justice that he thought of nothing but the terror of not being able to speak to them to say something to them no matter what which would prove to them that he had no fear well that was over he had not failed to say that is cowardly and he crossed his arms but he soon had to turn away his head in order not to see the use the table was put to that stood in the centre of the room where it had seemed to serve no purpose they had lifted the man still struggling up onto the little table they placed a rope about his neck then one of the judges one of the blond young men who seemed no older than rouletabille climbed on the table and slipped the other end of the rope through a great ring bolt that projected from a beam of the ceiling during this time the man struggled futilely and his death rattle rose at last through the continuing noise of his resistance and its overcoming but his last breath came with so violent a shake of the body that the whole death apparatus rope and ring bolts separated from the ceiling and rolled to the ground with the dead man rouletabille uttered a cry of horror you are assassins he cried but was the man surely dead it was this that the pale figures with yellow hair set themselves to make sure of he was then they brought two sacks and the dead man was slipped into one of them rouletabille said to them you are braver when you kill by an explosion you know he regretted bitterly that he had not died the night before in the explosion he did not feel very brave he talked to them bravely enough but he trembled as his time approached that death horrified him he tried to keep from looking at the other sack he took the two icons of saint luke and of the virgin from his pocket and prayed to them he thought of the lady in black and wept a voice in the shadows said he is crying the poor little fellow it was anuchka's voice rouletabille dried his tears and said monsieurs one of you must have a mother but all the voices cried no no we have mothers no more they have killed them cried some they have sent them to siberia cried others well i have a mother still said the poor lad i will not have the opportunity to embrace her it is a mother that i lost the day of my birth and that i have found again but i suppose it is to be said on the day of my death i shall not see her again i have a friend i shall not see him again either i have two little icons here for them and i am going to write a letter to each of them if you will permit it swear to me that you will see these reach them i swear it said in french the voice of Anuchka. thanks madam you are kind and now messieurs that is all i ask of you i know i am here to reply to very grave accusations permit me to say to you at once that i admit them all to be well founded consequently there need be no discussion between us i have deserved death and i accept it so permit me not to concern myself with what will be going on here i ask of you simply as a last favor not to hasten your preparations too much so that i may be able to finish my letters upon which satisfied with himself this time he sat down again and commenced to write rapidly they left him in peace as he desired he did not raise his head once even at the moment when a murmur louder than usual showed that the hearers regarded rouletabille's crimes with especial detestation he had the happiness of having entirely completed his correspondence once when they asked him to rise to hear judgment pronounced upon him the supreme communion that he had just had with his friend st clair and with the dear lady in black restored all his spirit to him he listened respectfully to the sentence which condemned him to death 
though he was busy sliding his tongue along the gummed edge of his envelope. These were the counts on which he was to be hanged. One, because he had come to Russia and mixed in affairs that did not concern his nationality, and had done this in spite of warning to remain in France. Two, because he had not kept the promises of neutrality he freely made to a representative of the Central Revolutionary Committee. Three, for trying to penetrate the mystery of the Trebasov dacha. Four, for having Comrade Mathieu whipped and imprisoned by Kupriyan. Five, for having denounced to Kupriyan the identity of the two doctors who had been assigned to kill General Trebasov. Six, for having caused the arrest of Natasha Fedorovna. It was a list longer than was needed for his doom. Rouletabille kissed his icons and handed them to Anuchka along with the letters. Then he declared with his lips trembling slightly, and a cold sweat on his forehead, that he was ready to submit to his fate. End of chapter 16 Read by Don W. Jenkins Rancho San Diego, California Shaggybark.blogspot.com Section 17 of The Secret of the Night by Gaston LaRue this LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Don W. Jenkins Chapter 17 The Last Cravat The gentleman of the Neva said to him, If you have nothing further to say, we will go into the courtyard. Rouletabille understood at last that hanging him in the room where judgment had been pronounced was rendered impossible by the violence of the prisoner just executed. Not only the rope and the ring-bolt had been torn away, but part of the beam had splintered. "'There is nothing more,' replied Rouletabille. He was mistaken. Something occurred to him. An idea flashed so suddenly that he became white as his shirt, and had to lean on the arm of the gentleman of the Neva in order to accompany him. The door was open. All the men who had voted his death filed out in gloomy silence. The gentleman of the Neva, who seemed charged with the last offices for the prisoner, pushed him gently out into the court. It was vast, and surrounded by a high board wall. Some small buildings with closed doors stood to right and left. A high chimney, partially demolished, rose from one corner. Rouletabille decided the whole place was part of some old abandoned mill. Above his head the sky was pale as a winding-sheet. A thunderous, intermittent, rhythmical noise appraised him that he could not be far from the sea. He had plenty of time to note all these things, for they had stopped the march to execution a moment, and had made him sit down in the open courtyard on an old box. A few steps away from him, under the shed where he certainly was going to be hanged, a man got upon a stool, the stool that would serve Rouletabille a few moments later, with his arm raised, and drove with a few blows of a mallet a great ring-bolt into a beam above his head. The reporter's eyes, which had not lost their habit of taking everything in, rested again on a coarse canvas sack that lay on the ground. The young man felt a slight tremor, for he saw quickly that the sack swathed the human form. He turned his head away, but only to confront another empty sack that was intended for him. Then he closed his eyes. The sound of music came from somewhere outside, notes of the balalaika. He said to himself, Well, we certainly are in Finland, for he knew that if the guzla is Russian, the balalaika certainly is Finnish. It is a kind of accordion that the peasants pick plaintively in the doorways of their tubas. He had seen and heard them the afternoon that he went to Pergalovo, and also a little further away, on the Vyborg line. He pictured to himself the ruined structure where he now found himself, shut in with the revolutionary tribunal, as it must appear from the outside to passers-by, unsinister, like many others near it, sheltering under its decaying roof a few homes of humble workers, resting now as they played the balalaika at their thresholds, with the day's labor over. And suddenly, from the ineffable peace of his last evening, while the balalaika mourned, and the man overhead tested the solidity of his ring-bolt, a voice outside, the grave, deep voice of Anuchka, sang for the little Frenchman, For whom weave we now the crown of lilac rose and thyme, 
when my hand falls lingering down who then will bring your crown of lilac rose and thyme oh that some one among you would hear and come and my lonely hand would press and shed the friendly tear for alone at the end i stand who now will bring the crown of lilac rose and thyme rouletabille listened to the voice dying away with the last sob of the balalaika it is too sad he said rising let us go and he wavered a little they came to search him all was ready above they pushed him gently toward the shed when he was under the ring-bolt near the stool they made him turn around and they read him something in russian doubtless less for him than for those there who did not understand french rouletabille had hard work to hold himself erect the gentleman of the neva said to him further monsieur we now read you the final formula it asks you to say whether before you die you have anything you wish to add to what we know concerning the sentence which has been passed upon you rouletabille thought that his saliva which at that moment he had the greatest difficulty in swallowing would not permit him to utter a word but disdain of such a weakness when he recalled the coolness of so many illustrious condemned people in their last moments brought him the last strength needed to maintain his reputation why said he this sentence is not wrongly drawn up i blame it only for being too short why has there been no mention of the crime i committed in contriving the tragic death of poor michael korsakoff michael korsakoff was a wretch pronounced the vindictive voice of the young man who had presided at the trial and who at this supreme moment happened to be face to face with rouletabille Kuprian's police by killing that man ridded us of a traitor rouletabille uttered a cry a cry of joy and while he had some reason for believing that at the point he had reached now of his too short career only misfortune could befall him yet here providence in his infinite grace sent him before he died this ineffable consolation the certainty that he had not been mistaken pardon pardon he murmured in an excess of joy which stifled him almost as much as the wretched rope would shortly do that they were getting ready behind him pardon one second yet one little second then messieurs then we are agreed in that are we this michael michael nikolaevitch was the last of the traitors the first said the heavy voice it is the same thing my dear monsieur a traitor a wretched traitor continued rouletabille a poisoner replied the voice a vulgar poisoner is that not so but tell me how a vulgar poisoner who under cover of nihilism worked for his own petty ends worked for himself and betrayed you all now rouletabille's voice rose like a fanfare someone said he did not deceive us long our enemies themselves undertook his punishment it was i cried rouletabille radiant again it was i who wound up that career i tell you that was managed right it was i who rid you of him ah i knew well enough messieurs at the bottom of my heart i knew that i could not be mistaken two and two make four always don't they and rouletabille is always rouletabille messieurs it is right after all but it was probable that it was also all wrong for the gentleman of the neva came up to him hat in hand and said monsieur you know now why the witnesses at your trial did not raise a fact against you that on the contrary was entirely in your favour now it only remains for us to execute the sentence which is entirely justified on other grounds ah but wait a little what the devil now that i am sure i have not been mistaken and that i have been myself rouletabille all the time i cling to life a little oh very much a hostile murmur showed the condemned man that the patience of his judges was getting near its limit monsieur interposed the president we know that you do not belong to the orthodox religion nevertheless we will bring a priest if you wish it yes yes that is it go for the priest cried rouletabille and he said to himself it is so much time gained one of the revolutionaries started over to a little cabin that had been transformed into a chapel while the rest of them looked at the reporter with a good deal less sympathy than they had been showing if his bravado had impressed them agreeably in the trial room they were beginning to be rather disgusted by his cries his protestations and all the manoeuvres by which he so apparently was trying to hold off the hour of his death but all at once rouletabille jumped up onto the fatal stool 
they believed he had decided finally to make an end of the comedy and die with dignity but he had mounted there only to give them a discourse messieurs understand me now if it is true that you are not suppressing me in order to avenge michael nikolaevitch then why do you hang me why do you inflict this odious punishment on me because you accuse me of causing natasha fedorovna's arrest truly i have been awkward of that and that alone i accuse myself it was you with your revolver who gave the signal to kuprian's agents you have done the dirty work for the police rouletabille tried vainly to protest to explain to say that his revolver shot on the contrary had saved the revolutionaries but no one cared to listen and no one believed him here is the priest monsieur said the gentleman of the neva one second these are my last words and i swear to you that after this i will pass the rope about my neck myself but listen to me listen to me closely natasha fedorovna was the most precious recruit you had was she not a veritable treasure declared the president his voice more and more impatient it was a terrible blow then continued the reporter a terrible blow for you this arrest terrible some of them ejaculated do not interrupt me very well then i am going to say this to you if i ward off this blow if after having been the unintentional cause of natasha's arrest i have the daughter of general trebasov set at liberty and that within twenty-four hours what do you say would you still hang me the president he who had the christ-like countenance said messieurs natasha feodorovna has fallen the victim of terrible machinations whose mystery we so far have not been able to penetrate she is accused of trying to poison her father and her stepmother and under such conditions that it seems impossible for human reason to demonstrate the contrary natasha feodorovna herself crushed by the tragic occurrence was not able to answer her accusers at all and her silence has been taken for a confession of guilt messieurs natasha feodorovna will be started for siberia to-morrow we can do nothing for her natasha feodorovna is lost to us then with a gesture to those who surrounded rouletabille do your duty messieurs pardon pardon but if i do prove the innocence of natasha just wait messieurs there is only i who can prove that innocence you lose natasha by killing me if you had been able to prove that innocence monsieur the thing would already be done you would not have waited pardon pardon it is only at this moment that i have become able to do it how is that it is because i was sick you see very seriously sick that affair of michael nikolaevitch and the poison that still continued after he was dead simply robbed me of all my powers now that i am sure i have not been the means of killing an innocent man i am rouletabille again it is not possible that i shall not find the way that i shall not see through this mystery the terrible voice of the christ-like figure said monotonously do your duty messieurs pardon pardon this is of great importance to you and the proof is that you have not yet hanged me you were not so procrastinating with my predecessor were you you have listened to me because you have hoped very well let me think let me consider oh the devil i was there myself at the fatal luncheon and i know better than anyone else all that happened there five minutes i demand five minutes of you it is not much five little minutes these last words of the condemned man seemed to singularly influence the revolutionaries they looked at one another in silence then the president took out his watch and said five minutes we grant them to you put your watch here here on this nail it is five minutes to seven eh you will give me until the hour yes until the hour the watch itself will strike when the hour has come ah it strikes like the general's watch then very well here we are then there was the curious spectacle of rouletabille standing on the hangman's stool the fatal rope hanging above his head his legs crossed his elbow on his knees in that eternal attitude which art has always given to human thought his fists under his jaws his eyes fixed all around him all those young men intent on his silence not moving a muscle turned into statues themselves that they might not disturb the statue which thought and thought End of chapter 17 Read by Don W. Jenkins Rancho San Diego, California Shaggybark.blogspot.com Section 18 of The Secret of the Night by Gaston LaRue 
This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Don W. Jenkins. Chapter 18 A Singular Experience the five minutes ticked away and the watch commenced to strike the hour's seven strokes did it sound the death of rouletabille perhaps not for at the first silver tinkle they saw rouletabille shake himself and raise his head with his face alight and his eyes shining they saw him stand up spread out his arms and cry i have found it such joy shone in his countenance that there seemed to be an aureole around him and none of those there doubted that he had the solution of the impossible problem. "'I have found it! I have found it!' they gathered around him. He waved them away as in a waking dream. "'Give me room! I have found it, if my experiment works out. One, two, three, four, five. What was he doing? He counted his steps now, in long paces, as in dueling preliminaries, and the others, all of them, followed him in silence, puzzled but without protest, as if they too were caught in the same strange daydream. Steadily counting his steps, he crossed thus the court, which was vast. Forty, forty-one, forty-two, he cried excitedly. This is certainly strange, and very promising. The others, although they did not understand, refrained from questioning him, for they saw there was nothing to do but let him go ahead without interruption, just as care is taken not to wake a somnambulist abruptly. They had no mistrust of his motives, for the idea was simply untenable that Rouletabille was fool enough to hope to save himself from them by an imbecile subterfuge. No, they yielded to the impression his inspired countenance gave them, and several were so affected that they unconsciously repeated his gestures. Thus Rouletabille reached the edge of the court where judgment had been pronounced against him. There he had to mount a rickety flight of stairs, whose steps he counted. He reached a corridor, but moving away from the side where the door was opening to the exterior, he turned toward a staircase leading to the upper floor, and still counted the steps as he climbed them. Some of the company followed him, others hurried ahead of him, but he did not seem aware of either the one or the other as he walked along, living only in his thoughts. He reached the landing-place, hesitated, pushed open a door, and found himself in a room furnished with a table, two chairs, a mattress, and a huge cupboard. He went to the cupboard, turned the key, and opened it. The cupboard was empty. He closed it again and put the key in his pocket. Then he went out on to the landing-place again. There he asked for the key of the chamber door he had just left. They gave it to him, and he locked that door and put that key also in his pocket. Now he returned into the court. He asked for a chair. It was brought to him. Immediately he placed his head in his hands, thinking hard, took the chair, and carried it over a little behind the shed. The nihilists watched everything he did, and they did not smile, because men do not smile when death waits at the end of things, however foolish. Finally Rouletabille spoke. Messieurs, he said, his voice low and shaken, because he knew that now he touched the decisive minute, after which there could only be an irrevocable fate. Messieurs, in order to continue my experiment, I am obliged to go through movements that might suggest to you the idea of an attempt at escape, or evasion. I hope you don't regard me as fool enough to have any such thought. Oh, monsieur, said the chief, you are free to go through all the maneuvers you wish. No one escapes us. Outside we should have you within arm's reach, quite as well as here. And besides, it is entirely impossible to escape from here. Very well. Then it is understood. In such a case, I ask you now to remain just where you are, and not to budge, whatever I do, if you don't wish to inconvenience me. Only please send someone now up to the next floor where I am going to go again, and let him watch what happens from there, but without interfering. And don't speak a word to me during the experiment. Two of the revolutionaries went to the upper floor, and opened a window in order to keep track of what went on in the court. All now showed their intense interest in the acts and gestures of Rouletabille. The reporter placed himself in the shed between his death-stool and his hanging-rope. "'Ready,' said he. "'I am going to begin.' and suddenly he jumped like a wild man, crossed the court in a straight line like a flash, disappeared in the tuba, bounded up the staircase, felt in his pocket, and drew out the keys, opened the door of the chamber he had locked, closed it and locked it again, turned right about face, came down again in the same haste, reached the court, and this time swerved to the chair, went around it, 
still running, and returned at the same speed to the shed. He no sooner reached there than he uttered a cry of triumph as he glanced at the watch hanging from a post. "'I have won,' he said, and threw himself with a happy thrill upon the fatal scaffold. They surrounded him, and he read the liveliest curiosity in all their faces. Panting still from his mad dash, he asked for two words apart with the chief of the secret committee. The man who had pronounced judgment, and who had the bearing of Jesus, advanced, and there was a brief exchange of words between the two young men. The others drew back and waited at a distance, in impressive silence, the outcome of this mysterious colloquy, which certainly would settle Rouletabille's fate. "'Messieurs,' said the chief, "'the young Frenchman is going to be allowed to leave. We give him twenty-four hours to set Natasha Fedorovna free. In twenty-four hours, if he has not succeeded, he will return here to give himself up.' A happy murmur greeted these words. The moment their chief spoke thus, they felt sure of Natasha's fate. The chief added, "'As the liberation of Natasha Feodorovna will be followed,' the young Frenchman says, "'by that of our companion Mathieu, we decide that, if these two conditions are fulfilled, M. Joseph Rouletabille is allowed to return in entire security to France, which he ought never to have left.' Two or three only of the group said, "'That lad is playing with us. It is not possible.' But the chief declared, "'Let the lad try.' He accomplishes miracles. End of chapter 18. Read by Don W. Jenkins, Rancho San Diego, California, shaggybark.blogspot.com. Section 19 of The Secret of the Night by Gaston LaRue. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Don W. Jenkins. CHAPTER Nineteen, THE Tsar. "'I have escaped by remarkable luck,' cried Rouletabille, as he found himself in the middle of the night, at the corner of the Catherine and the Aptikarsky Paraluk canals, while the mysterious carriage which had brought him there returned rapidly toward the Grand Ecury. "'What a country! What a country!' He ran a little way to the Grand Morskaya, which was near, entered the hotel like a bomb, dragged the interpreter from his bed, demanded that his bill be made out, and that he be told the time of the next train for Tsarskoy Cello. The interpreter told him that he could not have his bill at such an hour, that he could not leave town without his passport, and that there was no train for Tsarskoy Cello, and Rouletabille made an outcry that woke the whole hotel. The guests, fearing always un scandal, kept close to their rooms. But Monsieur le Directeur came down, trembling. When he found all that it was about, he was inclined to be peremptory, but Rouletabille, who had seen Michael Strogoff played, cried, Service of the Tsar, which turned him submissive as a sheep. He made out the young man's bill and gave him his passport, which had been brought back by the police during the afternoon. Rouletabille rapidly wrote a message to Kupriyan's address, which the messenger was directed to have delivered without a moment's delay, under the pain of death. The manager humbly promised— and the reporter did not explain that by pain of death he referred to his own. Then, having ascertained that as a matter of fact the last train had left for Tsarskoy Cello, he ordered a carriage and hurried to his room to pack. And he, ordinarily so detailed, so particular in his affairs, threw things every which way, linen, garments, with kicks and shoves. It was a relief after the emotions he had gone through. "'What a country!' he never ceased to ejaculate. "'What a country!' Then the carriage was ready, with two little Finnish horses whose gait he knew well, an evil-looking driver who none the less would get him there, the trunk, rubles to the domestics, Spasibo Barina, Spasibo, thank you, monsieur, thank you. The interpreter asked what address he should give the driver. The home of the Tsar. The interpreter hesitated, believing it to be an unbecoming pleasantry, then waved vaguely to the driver, and the horses started. What a curious trot! We have no idea of that in France, thought Rouletabille. France, France, Paris, is it possible that soon I shall be back? And that dear lady in black? Ah, at the first opportunity I must send her a dispatch of my return, before she receives those icons and the letters announcing my death. Scan, scan, scan! Hurry! The Itzvachik pounded his horses, crowding past the Dvorniks who watched at the corners of the houses during the St. Petersburg night. Dirigi, 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 look out! 
the country somber in the somber night the vast open country what monotonous desolation rapidly through the vast silent spaces the little car glided over the lonely route into the black arms of the pines rouletabille holding on to his seat looked about him god this is as sad as a funeral display little frozen huts no larger than tombs occasionally indicated the road but there was no mark of life in that country except the noise of the journey and the two beasts with steaming coats crack one of the shafts broken what a country to hear rouletabille one would suppose that only in russia could the shaft of a carriage break the repair was difficult and crude with bits of rope and from then on the journey was slow and cautious after the frenzied speed in vain rouletabille reasoned with himself you will arrive anyway before morning you cannot wake the emperor in the dead of night his impatience knew no reason what a country what a country after some other petty adventures they ran into a ravine and had tremendous difficulty rescuing the trunk they arrived at tsarskoy cello at a quarter of seven even here the country was not pleasant rouletabille recalled the bright awakening of the french country here it seemed there was something more dead than death it was this little city with its streets where no one passed not a soul not a phantom with its houses so impenetrable the windows even of glazed glass and further blinded by the morning hoarfrost shutting out light more thoroughly than closed eyelids behind them he pictured to himself a world unknown a world which neither spoke nor wept nor laughed a world in which no living chord resounded what a country where is the chateau i do not know i have been here only once in the marshal's carriage i do not know the way not the great palace the idiot of the driver has brought me to this great palace in order to see it i haven't a doubt does rouletabille look like a tourist durak the home of the tsar i tell you the tsar's residence the place where the little father lives chez batushka the driver lashed his ponies he drove past all the streets stoy stop cried rouletabille a gate a soldier musket at shoulder bayonet in play another gate another soldier another bayonet a park with walls around it and around the walls more soldiers no mistake here is the place thought rouletabille there was only one prisoner for whom such pains would be taken he advanced towards the gate ah they crossed bayonets under his nose halt no fooling joseph rouletabille of la poque a subaltern came from a guard-house and advanced toward him explanation evidently was going to be difficult the young man saw that if he demanded to see the tsar they would think him crazed and that would further complicate matters he asked for the grand marshal of the court they replied that he could get the marshal's address in tsarskoy but the subaltern turned his head he saw someone advancing it was the grand marshal himself some exceptional service called him without doubt very early to the court why what are you doing here you are not gone yet then monsieur rouletabille politeness before everything monsieur le grand marechal i would not go before saying au revoir to the emperor be so good since you are going to him and he has risen you yourself have told me he rises at seven be so good as to say to him that i wish to pay my respects before leaving your scheme doubtless is to speak to him once more regarding natasha feodorovna not at all tell him excellency that i am come to explain the mystery of the eiderdowns ah ah the eiderdowns you know something i know all the grand marshal saw that the young man did not pretend he asked him to wait a few minutes and vanished into the park a quarter of an hour later joseph rouletabille of the journal l'epoque was admitted into the cabinet that he knew well from the first interview he had had there with his majesty the simple workroom of a country house a few pictures on the walls portraits of the tsarina and the imperial children on the table oriental cigarettes in the tiny gold cups rouletabille was far from feeling any assurance for the grand marshal had said to him be cautious the emperor is in a terrible humour about you a door opened and closed the tsar made a sign to the marshal who disappeared rouletabille bowed low then watched the emperor closely quite apparently his majesty was displeased the face of the tsar ordinarily so calm so pleasant and smiling was severe and his eyes had an angry light he seated himself and lighted a cigarette monsieur he commenced i am not otherwise sorry to see you before your departure in order to say to you myself that i am not at all pleased with you if you were one of my subjects i would have already started you on the road to the ural mountains i remove myself farther sire 
monsieur i pray you not to interrupt me and not to speak unless i ask you a question oh pardon sire pardon i am not duped by the pretext you have offered monsieur le grand marechal in order to penetrate here it is not a pretext sire again oh pardon sire pardon i say to you that called here to aid me against my enemies they themselves have not found a stronger or more criminal support than in you of what am i accused sire Cuprian. ah ah pardon my chief of police justly complains that you have traversed all his designs and that you have taken it upon yourself to ruin them first you removed his agents who inconvenienced you it seems then the moment that he had the proof in hand of the abominable alliance of natasha feodorovna with the nihilists who attempted the assassination of her father your intervention has permitted that proof to escape him and you have boasted of the feat monsieur so that we can only consider you responsible for the attempts that followed without you natasha would not have attempted to poison her father without you they would not have sent to find physicians who could blow up the dasha des Iles. finally no later than yesterday when this faithful servant of mine had set a trap they could not have escaped from you have had the audacity you to warn them of it they owe their escape to you monsieur these are attempts against the security of the state which deserves the heaviest punishment why you went out one day from here promising me to save general trebasoff from all the plotting assassins who lurked about him and then you play the game of the assassins your conduct is as miserable as that of natasha feodorovna is monstrous the emperor ceased and looked at rouletabille who had not lowered his eyes what can you say for yourself speak now i can only say to your majesty that i come to take leave of you because my task here is finished i have promised you the life of general trebasoff and i bring it to you he runs no danger any more i say further to your majesty that there exists nowhere in the world a daughter more devoted to her father even to the death a daughter more sublime than natasha feodorovna nor more innocent be careful monsieur i inform you that i have studied this affair personally and very closely you have the proofs of these statements you advance yes sire and i i have the proofs that natasha feodorovna is a renegade at this contradiction uttered in a firm voice the emperor stirred a flush of anger and of outraged majesty on his face but after this first movement he succeeded in controlling himself opened a drawer brusquely took out some papers and threw them on the table here they are rouletabille reached for the papers you do not read russian monsieur i will translate their purport for you know then that there has been a mysterious exchange of letters between natasha feodorovna and the central revolutionary committee and that these letters show the daughter of general trebasoff to be in perfect accord with the assassins of her father for the execution of their abominable project the death of the general i declare to your majesty that that is not possible obstinate man i will read useless sire it is impossible there may be in them the question of a project but i am greatly surprised if these conspirators have been sufficiently imprudent to write in those letters that they count on natasha to poison her father that as a matter of fact is not written and you yourself are responsible for it not being there it does not follow any the less that natasha feodorovna had an understanding with the nihilists that is correct sire ah you confess that i do not confess i simply affirm that natasha had an understanding with the nihilists who plotted their abominable attacks against the ex-governor of moscow sire since natasha had an understanding with the nihilists it was not to kill her father but to save him and the project of which you hold here the proofs but of whose character you are unaware is to end the attacks of which you speak instantly you say that i speak the truth sire where are the proofs show me your papers i have none i have only my word that is not sufficient it will be sufficient once you have heard me i listen sire before revealing to you a secret on which depends the life of general trebasoff you must permit me some questions your majesty holds the life of the general very dear what is that to do with it pardon i desire that your majesty assure me on that point the general has protected my throne he has saved the empire from one of the greatest dangers that it has ever run if the servant who has done such a service should be rewarded by death by the punishment that the enemies of my people prepare for him in darkness i should never forgive myself there have been too many martyrs already 
you have replied to me sire in such a way that you make me understand there is no sacrifice even to the sacrifice of your amour propre the greatest a ruler can suffer no sacrifice too dear to ransom from death one of these martyrs ah ah these gentlemen lay down conditions to me money money they need money and at how much did they rate the head of the general sire that does not touch your majesty and i never will come to offer you such a bargain that matter concerns only natasha feodorovna who has offered her fortune her fortune but she has nothing she will have one at the death of the general now she engages to give it all to the revolutionary committee the day the general dies if he dies a natural death the emperor rose greatly agitated to the revolutionary party what do you tell me the fortune of the general eh but these are great riches sire i have told you the secret you alone should know it and guard it forever and i have your sacred word that when the hour comes you will let the prize go where it is promised if the general ever learns of such a thing such a treaty he would easily arrange that nothing should remain and he would denounce his daughter who has saved him and then he would promptly be the prey of his enemies and yours from whom you wish to save him i have told the secret not to the emperor but to the representative of god on the russian earth i have confessed it to the priest who is bound to forget the words uttered only before god allow natasha feodorovna her own way sire and her father your servant whose life is so dear to you is saved at the natural death of the general his fortune will go to his daughter who has disposed of it rouletabille stopped a moment to judge the effect produced it was not good the face of his august listener was more and more in a frown the silence continued and now the reporter did not dare to break it he waited finally the emperor rose and walked forward and backward across the room deep in thought for a moment he stopped at the window and waved paternally to the little tsarevich who played in the park with the grand duchesses but then he returned to rouletabille and pinched his ear but tell me how have you learned all this and who then has poisoned the general and his wife in the kiosk if not natasha natasha is a saint it is nothing sire that she has been raised in luxury and vows herself to misery but it is sublime that she guards in her heart the secret of her sacrifice from every one and in spite of all because secrecy is necessary and has been required of her i see her guarding it before her father who has been brought to believe in the dishonour of his daughter and still to be silent when a word would have proved her innocent guarding it face to face with her fiance whom she loves and repulses because marriage is forbidden to the girl who is supposed to be rich and who will be poor guarding it above all and guarding it still in the depths of the dungeon and ready to take the road to siberia under the accusation of assassination because that ignominy is necessary for the safety of her father that sire o oh, sire do you see but you how have you been able to penetrate into this guarded secret by watching her eyes by observing when she believed herself alone the look of terror and the gleams of love and beyond all by looking at her when she was looking at her father ah sire there were moments when on her mystic face one could read the wild joy and devotion of the martyr then by listening and by piecing together scraps of phrases inconsistent with the idea of treachery but which immediately acquired a meaning if one thought of the opposite of sacrifice and that is it sire consider always the alternative motive what i finally could see myself the others who had a fixed opinion about natasha could not see and why had they their fixed opinion simply because the idea of compromise with the nihilists aroused at once the idea of complicity for such people it is always the same thing they never can see but the one side of a situation but nevertheless the situation had two sides as all situations have the question was simple the compromise was certain but why had natasha compromised herself with the nihilists was it necessary in order to lose her father might it not be on the contrary in order to save him when one has rendezvous with an enemy it is not necessarily to enter into his game sometimes it is to disarm him with an offer between these two hypotheses which i alone took the trouble to examine i did not hesitate long because natasha's every attitude proclaimed her innocence and her eyes sire in which one read purity and love prevailed always with me against all the passing appearances of disgrace and crime i saw that natasha negotiated with them but what had she to place in the scales against the life of her father nothing except the fortune that she would have one day 
Some words she spoke about the impossibility of immediate marriage, about poverty which could always knock at the door of any mansion, remarks that I was able to overhear between Natasha and Boris Morozov, which to him meant nothing, put me definitely on the right road, and I was not long in ascertaining that the negotiations in this formidable affair were taking place in the very house of Trebasov, pursued without by the incessant spying of Kuprian, who sought to surprise her in company with the nihilists, watched closely too by the jealous supervision of Boris, who was jealous of Michael Nikolaevitch, she had to seize the only opportunities possible for such negotiations, at night, in her own home, the sole place where by the very audacity of it she was able to play her part in any security. Michael Nikolaevitch knew Anuchka. There was certainly the point of departure for the negotiations which that felon officer, traitor to all sides, worked at will toward the realization of his own infamous project. I do not think that Michael ever confided to Natasha that he was, from the very first, the instrument of the revolutionaries. Natasha, who sought to get in touch with the revolutionary party, had to entrust him with a correspondence for Anuchka, following which he assumed direction of the affair, deceiving the nihilists, who, in their absolute penury, following the revolt, had been seduced by the proposition of General Trebasov's daughter, and deceiving Natasha, whom he pretended to love, and by whom he believed himself loved. At this point in the affair, Natasha came to understand that it was necessary to propitiate Michael Nikolaevitch, her indispensable intermediary, and she managed to do it so well that Boris Murazov felt the blackest jealousy. On his side, Michael came to believe that Natasha would have no other husband than himself, but he did not propose to marry a penniless girl. And fatally, it followed that Natasha, in that infernal intrigue, negotiated for the life of her father through the agency of a man who underhandedly sought to strike at the general himself because the immediate death of her father before the negotiation was completed would enrich Natasha, who had given Michael so much to hope. That frightful tragedy, sire, in which we have lived our most painful hours, appeared to me, confident of Natasha's innocence, as absolutely simple as for the others it seemed complicated. Natasha believed she had in Michael Nikolaevitch a man who worked for her, but he worked only for himself. The day that I was convinced of it, sire, by my examination of the approach to the balcony, I had a mind to warn Natasha to go to her and say, Get rid of that man, he will betray you. If you need an agent, I am at your service. But that day at Krestowski, destiny prevented my rejoining Natasha, and I must attribute it to destiny which would not permit the loss of that man. Michael Nikolaevitch, who was a traitor, was too much in the combination, and if he had been rejected he would have ruined everything. I caused him to disappear. The great misfortune, then, was that Natasha, holding me responsible for the death of a man she believed innocent, never wished to see me again, and, when she did see me, refused to have any conversation with me because I proposed that I take Michael's place for her with the revolutionaries. She would have nothing to do with me in order to protect her secret. Meantime, the nihilists believed they were betrayed by Natasha when they learned of the death of Michael, and they undertook to avenge him. They seized Natasha and bore her off by force. The unhappy girl learned then, that same evening, of the attack which destroyed the Dasha, and happily still spared her father. This time she reached a definite understanding with the revolutionary party. Her bargain was made. I offer you for proof of it only her attitude when she was arrested, and, even in that moment, her sublime silence. While Rouletabille urged his view, the emperor let him talk on and on, and now his eyes were dim. Is it possible that Natasha has not been the accomplice in all of Michael Nikolaevitch? he demanded. It was she who opened her father's house to him that night. If she was not his accomplice, she would have mistrusted him, she would have watched him. Sire, Michael Nikolaevitch was a very clever man. He knew so well how to play upon Natasha and Anuchka, in whom she placed all her hope. It was from Anuchka that she wished to hold the life of her father. It was the word, the signature of Anuchka, that she demanded before giving her own. The evening Michael Nikolaevitch died, he was charged to bring her that signature. I know it myself, because, pretending drunkenness, I was able to overhear enough of a conversation between Anuchka and a man whose name I must conceal. Yes, that last evening, Michael Nikolaevitch, when he entered the dacha, had the signature in his pocket, but also he carried the weapon or the poison with which he already had attempted, and was resolved to reach the father of her whom he believed was assuredly to be his wife. You speak now of a paper, very precious, that I regret not to possess, monsieur, said the Tsar coldly, 
because that paper alone would have proved to me the innocence of your protege if you have it not sire you know well that it is because i have wished you to have it the corpse had been searched by katharina the little bohemian and i sire prevented Couperiane from finding that signature in katharina's possession in saving the secret i have saved general trebasov's life who would have preferred to die rather than accept such an arrangement the tsar stopped rouletabille in his enthusiastic outburst all that would be very beautiful and perhaps admirable said he more and more coldly because he had entirely recovered himself if natasha had not herself with her own hand poisoned her father and her stepmother always with arsenate of soda oh some of that had been left in the house replied rouletabille they had not given me all of it for the analysis after the first attempt but natasha is innocent of that sire i swear it to you as true as that i have certainly escaped being hanged how hanged oh it has not amounted to much now your majesty and rouletabille recounted his sinister adventure up to the moment of his death or rather up to the moment when he had believed he was going to die the emperor listened to the young reporter with complete stupefaction he murmured poor lad then suddenly but how have you managed to escape them sire they have given me twenty-four hours for you to set natasha at liberty that is to say that you restore her to her rights all her rights and she to be always the recognized heiress of trebasov do you understand me sire i will understand you perhaps when you have explained to me how natasha has not poisoned her father and stepmother there are some things so simple sire that one is able to think of them only with a rope around one's neck but let us reason it out we have here four persons two of whom have been poisoned and the other two with them have not been now it is certain that of the four persons the general has not wished to poison himself that his wife has not wished to poison the general and that as for me i have not wished to poison anybody that if we are absolutely sure of it leaves as the poisoner only natasha that is so certain so inevitable that there is only one case one alone where in such conditions natasha would not be regarded as the poisoner i confess that logically i do not see said the tsar anything beyond that but more and more of a tangle what is it logically the only case would be that where no one had been poisoned that is to say where no one had taken any poison but the presence of the poison has been established cried the emperor still the presence of the poison proves only its presence not the crime both poison and epicac were found in the stomach expulsions from which a crime has been concluded what state of affairs was necessary for there to have been no crime simply that the poison should have appeared in the expulsions after the epicac then there would have been no poisoning but everybody would believe that there had been and for that someone would have poured the poison into the expulsions the tsar never quitted rouletabille's eyes that is extraordinary said he but of course it is possible in any case it is still only a hypothesis and so long as it could be an hypothesis that no one thought of it it could be just that sire but if i am here it is because i have the proof that that hypothesis corresponds to the reality that necessary proof of natasha's innocence your majesty i have found with the rope around my neck ah uh, i tell you it was time what has hindered us hitherto i do not say to realize but even to think of that hypothesis simply that we thought the illness of the general had commenced before the absorption of the ipecac since matrena petrovna had been obliged to go for it to her medicine closet after his illness commenced in order to counteract the poison of which she also appeared to be the victim but if i acquire proof that matrena petrovna had the ipecac at hand before the sickness my hypothesis of pretense at poisoning has irresistible force because if it was not to use it before why did she have it with her before and if it was not that she wished to hide the fact that she had used it before why did she wish to make believe that she went to find it afterwards then in order to show natasha's innocence here is what must be proved that matrena petrovna had the ipecac on her even when she went to look for it young rouletabille i hardly breathe said the tsar breathe sire the proof is here matrena petrovna necessarily had the ipecac on her because after the sickness she had not the time for going to find it do you understand sire between the moment when she fled from the kiosk and when she returned there she had not the actual time to go to her medicine chest to find the ipecac how have you been able to compute the time asked the emperor 
Sire, the Lord God directed, who made me admire Feodor Feodorovitch's watch just when we went to read, and to read on the dial of that watch two minutes to the hour, and the Lord God directed yet who, after the scene of the poison, at the time Matrena returned carrying the ipecac publicly, made the hour strike from that watch in the general's pocket. Two minutes. It was impossible for Matrena to have covered that distance in two minutes. She could only have entered the deserted dacha and left it again instantly. She had not taken the trouble to mount to the floor above, where she told us and repeated when she returned the ipecac was in the medicine closet. She lied and if she lied, all is explained. It was the striking of a watch, sire, with a striking apparatus and a sound like the general's, there in the quarters of the revolutionaries that roused my memory and indicated to me in a second this argument of the time. I got down from my gallows scaffold, your majesty, to experiment on that time limit. Oh, nothing and nobody could have prevented my making that experiment before I died, to prove to myself that Rouletabille had all along been right. I had studied the grounds around the dacha enough to be perfectly exact about the distances. I found in the court where I was to be hanged the same number of steps that there were from the kiosk to the steps of the veranda, and as the staircase of the revolutionaries had fewer steps, I lengthened my journey a few steps by walking around a chair. Finally, I attended to the opening and closing of the doors that Matrena would have had to do. I had looked at a watch when I started. When I returned, sire, and looked at the watch again, I had taken three minutes to cover the distance, and it is not for me to boast, but I am a little livelier than the excellent Matrena. Matrena had lied. Matrena had simulated the poisoning of the general. Matrena had coolly poured ipecac into the general's glass while we were illustrating with matches a curious enough theory of the nature of the constitution of the empire. But this is abominable cried the emperor, this time definitely convinced by the intricate argument of Rouletabille. And what end could this imitation serve? The end of preventing the real crime, the end that she believed herself to have attained, sire, to have Natasha removed forever, Natasha whom she believed capable of any crime. Oh, this is monstrous. Feodor Feodorovitch has often told me that Matrena loved Natasha sincerely. She loved her sincerely up to the day that she believed her guilty. Matrena Petrovna was sure of Natasha's complicity in Michael Nikolaevich's attempt to poison the general. I shared her stupor, her despair, when Feodor Feodorovitch took his daughter in his arms after that tragic night and embraced her. He seemed to absolve her. It was then that Matrena resolved within herself to save the general in spite of himself. But I remained persuaded that if she had dared such a plan against Natasha, it would only be because of what she believed definite proof of her stepdaughter's infamy. These papers, sire, that you have shown me, and which show, if nothing more, an understanding between Natasha and the revolutionaries, could only have been in the possession of Michael or of Natasha. Nothing was found in Michael's quarters. Tell me, then, that Matrena found them in Natasha's apartment. Then she did not hesitate. If one outlined her crime to her, do you believe she would confess it? asked the emperor. I am so sure of it that I have had her brought here. By now Kuprian should be here at the chateau with Matrena Petrovna. You think of everything, monsieur. The Tsar moved to ring a bell. Rouletabille raised his hand. Not yet, sire. I ask that you permit me not to be present at the confusion of that brave, heroic, good woman who has loved me much. But before I go, sire, do you promise me? The emperor believed that he had not heard correctly or did not grasp the meaning. He repeated what Rouletabille had said. The young reporter repeated it once more. Do you promise? No, sire, I am not mad. I dare to ask you that. I have confided my honor to your majesty. I have told you Natasha's secret. Well, now, before Matrena's confession, I dare to ask you. Promise me to forget that secret. It will not suffice merely to give Natasha back again to her father. It is necessary to leave her course open to her, if you really wish to save General Trebasov. What do you decide, sire? It is the first time anyone has questioned me, monsieur. Ah, well, it will be the last, but I humbly beg your majesty to reply. That would be many millions given to the revolution. Oh, sire, they are not given yet. The general is sixty-five, but he has many years ahead of him, if you wish it. By the time he dies a natural death, if you wish it, your enemies will have disarmed. My enemies, murmured the Tsar in a low voice. No, no, my enemies will never disarm. Who then will be able to disarm them? Added he melancholily, shaking his head. Progress, sire, if you wish it. 
the tsar turned red and looked at the audacious young man who met the gaze of his majesty frankly it is kind of you to say that my young friend but you speak as a child as a child of france to the father of the russian people it was said in a voice so solemn and at the same time so naively touching that the tsar started he gazed again for some time in silence at this boy who this time turned away his brimming eyes progress and pity sire well said the emperor it is promised rouletabille was not able to restrain a joyous movement hardly in keeping you can ring now sire and the tsar rang the reporter passed into a little salon where he found the marshal kuprian and matrena petrovna who was in a state she threw a suspicious glance at rouletabille who was not treated this morning as the dear little domovoy duke she permitted herself to be conducted already trembling before the emperor what happened asked kuprian agitatedly it so happened my dear monsieur kuprian that i have the pardon of the emperor for all the crimes you have charged against me and that i wish to shake hands before i go without any rancour monsieur kuprian the emperor will tell you himself that general trebasov is saved and that his life will never be in danger any more do you know what follows it follows that you must at once set Mathieu free whom i have taken if you remember under my protection tell him that he is going to make his way to france I will find him a place on condition that he forgets certain lashes. Such a promise, such an attitude toward me, cried Kuprian. But I will wait for the emperor to tell me all these fine things. And your Natasha, what do you do with her? We release her also, monsieur. Natasha never has been the monster you think. How can you say that? Someone at least is guilty. There are two guilty. The first, monsieur le maréchal. What? cried the marshal monsieur le maréchal who had the imprudence to bring such dangerous grapes to the dacha des Iles, and 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 the other asked kuprian more and more anxiously listen there said rouletabille pointing toward the emperor's cabinet the sound of tears and sobs reached them the grief and the remorse of matrena petrovna passed the walls of the cabinet kuprian was completely disconcerted suddenly the emperor appeared he was in a state of exaltation such as had never been known in him Kuprian, dismayed, drew back. Monsieur, said the Tsar to him, I require that Natasha Feodorovna be here within the next two hours, and that she be conducted with the honors due to her rank. Natasha is innocent, and we must make reparation to her. Then, turning toward Rouletabille, I have learned what she knows and what she owes to you. We owe to you, my young friend. The Tsar said, My young friend, rouletabille at this last moment before his departure spoke russian then she knows nothing sire that is better sire because your majesty and me we must forget right from to-day that we know anything you are right said the tsar thoughtfully but my friend what am i to do for you sire one favour do not let me miss the train at ten fifty five and he threw himself on his knees remain on your knees my friend you are ready thus monsieur le maréchal will prepare at once a brevet which i will immediately sign meantime monsieur le maréchal find me in my own closet one of my saint anne's collars and it was thus that joseph rouletabille of l'epoque was created officer of saint anne of russia by the emperor himself who gave him the accolade they combine the whole course of time in this country thought rouletabille pressing his hand to his eyes to hold back the tears for the train at ten fifty five everybody had crowded at tsarskoy cello station among those who had come from st petersburg to press the young reporter's hand when they learned of his impending departure were ivan petrovitch the jolly counsellor of the emperor and athanase georgevitch the lively advocate so well known for his famous exploits with knife and fork they had come naturally with all their bandages and dressings which made them look like glorious ruins they brought the greetings of Fyodor Fyodorovitch, who still had a little fever, and of Thaddeus Chichnikov, the Lithuanian, who had both legs broken. Even after he was in his compartment, Rouletabille had to drink his last drink of champagne. When nothing remained in the bottle, and everyone had embraced and re-embraced him, as the train did not start quite yet, Athanase Georgevitch opened a second last bottle. It was then that Monsieur Le Grand Marechal arrived, out of breath. They invited him to drink, and he accepted. But he had need to speak with Rouletabille in private, and he drew the reporter, after excuses, out into the corridor. "'It is the Emperor himself who has sent me,' said the high dignitary, with emotion. "'He has sent me about the Eiderdowns. You forgot to explain the Eiderdowns to him.' "'Nyet!' 
replied Rouletabille, laughing. That is nothing, Nichevo. His Majesty's eiderdowns are of the finest eider, as one of the feathers that you have shown me demonstrates. Well, open them now. They are a cheap imitation, as the second feather proves. The return of the false eiderdowns before evening proves then that they hoped the substitution would pass undetected. That is all. Caracho, collapse of the hoax. Your health. Vive le Tsar. Caracho, Caracho. The locomotive was puffing when a couple were seen running, a man and a woman. It was Monsieur and Madame Gunsovsky. Gunsovsky stood on the running board. Madame Gunsovsky has insisted upon shaking hands. You are very congenial. Compliments, madame. Tell me, young man, you did wrong to fail dinner at my house yesterday. I would have certainly escaped a disagreeable little journey into Finland. I do not regret it, monsieur. The train trembled and moved. They cried. Vive la France! Vive la Russe! Athanase Georgievich wept. Matrena Petrovna, at a window of the station whither she had timidly retired, waved a handkerchief to the little Dumovoy Duke, who had made her see everything in the right light, and whom she did not dare to embrace after the terrible affair of the false poison and the Tsar's anger. The reporter threw her a respectful kiss. As he said to Gunsovsky, there was nothing to be regretted. All the same, as the train took its way toward the frontier, Rouletabille threw himself back on the cushions and said, Oof! End of chapter 19 End of The Secret of the Night by Gaston LaRue Read by Don W. Jenkins, Rancho San Diego, California, shaggybark.blogspot.com